right, we are back. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for our first two webinars this morning. Um, I don't know about you, but I really admire uh, cerebrovascular and endovascular surgeons and their ability to do such complex procedures. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's just truly remarkable. So um, we're really appreciative of Dr. Cerule uh, for offering his time and expertise um, in our last virtual OR. Um, here we have, hello, good morning, Dr. Ben Shalom. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, if you guys tuned in yesterday, you will recognize Dr. Nathaniel Ben Shalom. Um, he is one of our attending neurosurgeons here at Lenox Hill Neurosurgery. And Dr. Ben Shalom is um, actually a dual fellowship trained neurosurgeon. Uh, he uh, trained in both neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery um, at Johns Hopkins University and uh, recently completed a fellowship in neuro-oncology and skull-based surgery here at Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, we were so impressed with his incredible uh, skills and insights into the emerging subspecialty of neuroplastic surgery that pretty much after like just a few days of him being here, we were like, um, can you join our team? We love you. Um, so, and um, Dr. Ben Shalom is, um, has actually um, helped us establish the first um, and only neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery program in New York State. Um, this is an, a really, really amazing subspecialty. I don't want to talk too much because I want to give him some time. Um, but um, just so you know, neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery, I'm sure as Nadi is going to share, is not cosmetic. This is not about um, giving our patients, um, you know, cosmetic surgery. It all is about restoring form function and self-confidence, um, within our patients who, um, have either suffered, um, head traumas or are, um, or have defects of their skull or scalp. So without further ado, I'm going to pass off, um, the spotlight to Dr. Ben Shalom. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks, Hannah. This is exciting. And, uh, like always, thank you so much for your incredible, um, you know, skills moderating that and understanding what we do and really be part of this team. It's very unique that you were able in such a short time to sort of fit in uh, like a puzzle piece and uh, really get the gist of everything that we do. I'm impressed every, every time. So thank you so much. I have to give a lot of credit to you because you've been an incredible mentor. So thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, let me, uh, so I would actually like to start, uh, you know, yesterday after I gave a talk, I was kind of, I had to run away for a clinic. So I would first start and ask you guys to tell me if before I start the talk and, you know, and the talk is going to be uh, basically two different uh, sessions. The first session today, which you're going to give, uh, you know, the introduction to this new field and the next session uh, next Wednesday. But before I start, is there or are there any people that want to ask any questions regarding anything that we talked yesterday? Because I would like to shift gears from uh, the yesterday's talk, which was mostly on uh, global training, global neurosurgery, and how I, uh, you know, how I established myself in the U.S., and then shift gears to uh, doing more of uh, this uh, neuroplastic uh, talk and uh, and ex essentially um, share and expose you to this new field. If you have anything um, that is related to yesterday's talk, please uh, ask it now, Hannah. Uh, can you moderate that and see if there are any questions? Absolutely. Um, so again, please post your questions in the Q&A. It's easier for us to record if we've answered them live, if um, you put them in the Q&A. Um, we do have um, one question um, uh, from the chat. Um, um, how, do you, how did you establish yourself in the U.S. Um, and get the experience you did prior um, to um, getting into medical school and becoming a professional neurosurgeon? All right, so uh, so basically, you know, it takes time and a lot of um, hard work and patience. The way I did that, I um, 
managed to get sabis and clerkships in the U.S. since uh, second year medical school. Essentially, every summer holiday and every uh, and every uh, every summer or semester break, I would be coming to the U.S. to do some kind of elective. And those things need to be set uh, in advance, and you can essentially find yourself in any department that offer that across the United States. Basically, what you do, you expose yourself to the system, and then you get to know others. And by doing that, you achieve uh, two things. One, you come uh, become more familiar with that system and get to know people. And two, people get to know you. And essentially, you know, one of the most important thing is to uh, establish relationships and connections that can then further your uh, your goals in your training. And this is what I did. I I find a lot of new friends and and mentors that gave me good connections and phone calls and letters and recommend me where to go and how to do this. And this is sort of how I built you know, or establish myself over the course of 10 years, of course, this is not happening after one, uh, you know, one visit. And, and this is how I would suggest you to do about with uh, clerkships, observerships, and then research fellowships, and nothing was uh, paid, you know, it's a, it's a, I always get this question, is it funded? Do you get grants for this? Who pays for it? Nobody's paid for, for it. I had to pay it from my own pocket to be able to come here, observe, learn, and um, and yeah, get those letters in the end. Um, another question. Um, what do you recommend to uh, students still in med school who are um, still looking for a um, method of studying? Um, they might not have found like the the right um, um, I guess process to retain all the information that they're learning in school. Um, what would you recommend to students who are um, maybe struggling um, with ADHD like yourself or or just are struggling to um, find that study method that works for them? You know, it's very individual. I think that uh, everybody has to find their own uh, their own method. No, um, there is no one size fits all, and you know, you know everybody you know, is studying differently and cut differently. I think that what worked for me is more auditory. I like to listen to uh, to lectures. I like to summarize. It was very, uh, you know, helpful for me to focus on one task at a time. Even though I had multiple different finals, I sort of find a way to focus on, on, on each task at a time and build more layers. And obviously, you know, the other thing that really helped me is, um, is, um, um, is um, concentrating on other things, but studying, you know, I like to work out and I like to go out skiing. And this really helped me uh, establish a sense of calmness and sense of well-being that also adds another layer of uh, the, my ability to focus and concentrate. That what uh, worked for me. I cannot recommend anything specific because it's so different. Everybody studies different. Uh, but, you know, for, for at least two semesters, I had to study how to study. Uh, and that was uh, that was challenging um, by itself. And um, uh, just um, knowing that your field is new, do you have any recommendations for undergrad and med school students to participate in neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery uh, clinical research? I think that there are two main events for that are open to everyone that uh, you can learn more about uh, neuroplastic surgery. One is the, uh, uh, we used to call it the Harvard Hopkins Symposium. Every year it's alternating between Boston and Baltimore. And this is open for everybody, which is two complete days learning from the best uh, and the most innovating and also the, the practicing physician in neuroplastic surgery. This is a conference that, um, we're uh, we're doing every December. The other one that I started to do is the one in Northwell, which is a boot camp that we try to open for undergrad students. Basically, it's coming and learning and and understanding a little bit more about neuroplastic surgery, and that's the way to meet the people, make the connections, and also engage in research endeavors. Um, really good question about uh, burnout and imposter syndrome. How do you combat? Um... Um, both of those um, working in a field that, you know, it, it it's, can be quite daunting at times. Um, how, do, how do you address those things? Uh, you know, that's a very good question. And I try to, um, 
I try to think about it quite often. And I think that if I had to talk about the grand scheme of things is you need to have good work-life balance. Your life should have a very strong support system. I'm lucky, very lucky to have my amazing family supporting everything that I do and me supporting them. And I think that since what we do is so high performance and so tough, you really need to learn from the sports psychology world and know when to go all in but also know when to go all out. And if you go all in uh, during surgery and writing papers and meetings and talking to you guys and presenting and, and uh, you know, focusing your efforts on patient care, which really carries, uh, you know, a lot of energy and time and resources, you need to know when to zoom out and be completely all out and do nothing. Uh, do nothing. Uh, uh, you know, really enjoy little hobbies and, and, and things that disconnect you from your work. And I think this balance helps me at least uh, overcome uh, burnout. Amazing. And, um, and, and kind of in conjunction with that, like what keeps you motivated um, um, and what has keep, kept you motivated throughout your career? Um, you know, that's very, that's very good question. And, and, um, and it changed. It changed. What was keeping me motivated a year ago is not what keeping me motivated today. Um, well, first of all, I found my passion and I love neurosurgery and I love uh, what I do. And, you know, this is not work for me. It's it's not um, going to work. Uh, I don't consider it as, as, as working. I consider it as... Um, as my life, I, I I really enjoy and passionate about what I do, and you know the other thing is that I I stopped or I try to transition from looking about myself and what do I gain from this and the ego about being a neurosurgeon and saving lives and enhancing lives and and feeling good about yourself and. Uh, and the, and the ego you get whenever, you know, patients come to see you from all over the world, I start to see things differently and really ask myself how I can do more to help more people. Um, and this is a little bit more philosophical, I would say, or spiritual. It's not about me anymore. It's about what is it I got skill set that is unique, what I can do or, or what is it that I need to do in order to uh, make this world better and help other patients. Uh, basically, I see my skills as a channel to um, help other people. And when you sort of reframe the reason you do this, it's much easier to come overcome any burnout or any, you know, stress or, you know, you know, because you ask yourself, what is the world wants you to do, right? What is life? What are you here for? And if I'm blessed to get to have those, you know, skill set and to be passionate about something, it's not about what do I gain anymore. It's not about how many patients I operate, you know, and how, and how many people come to see me. It's about how can I influence and improve lives of others. And when you think this way, uh, when there is a shift, I think this is where how you become really successful and how burnout uh, and motivation is not even it's not even an issue. Well, that is uh, you're so inspiring. Um, again, I, I just am so appreciative that I have the opportunity to work from you and um, for your mentorship and for teaching me about neuroplastics. I feel like this is a good segue um, in terms of helping improve our patients' quality of lives right into on your uh, presentation on neuroplastic and reconstruction surgery. So um, again, this is um, a new and emerging field and it's not cosmetic. It's not about aesthetics. It really is um, about um, preserving the form and function of the skull, the scalp, and making sure our patients who have neurosurgical procedures don't have to be reminded that they've had these um, these procedures, they can go on and live their day-to-day -day lives feeling like their best, healthiest selves. So I'll, I'll again, pass off the mic to you. Um, you have so much more to share 
um, than I do, but um, I'm uh, again just appreciative of you share you teaching me all about this amazing subspecialty. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks for uh, really nailing it down each and every time. Um, do you see my screen now? Yes. All right, excellent. So I divided my talk into uh, um, two different segments. The first segments uh, of today, I'll sort of share the art and science of neuroplastic surgery, the history behind it, uh, why do we need that, what is it, what can we do with it, and then my next segment, which is going to be next Wednesday, is going over cases, so you can really see and um, understand practically how it looks like, all right? Um, I always like to start my presentation with this picture. Basically, those are pictures of my patients. And I always like by, you know, starting this talk by asking each and every one of you to look at the faces of those people. And if you had to guess which one of those patients has a skull uh, made with a computer 3D printed that is covering 50% of their skull, who would that be? And then the second question is, if you had to guess which one of those patients has a computer that stops epilepsy seizures inside their head, which one would that be? And look around and try to guess which one do you think has that. And, and the last one, and you'll meet some of those patients uh, you know, in, the, in the presentation. If I had to ask you which one of those patients had a giant brain tumor in the size of a softball, that was completely deforming their head that made them look like they haven't, you know, attached softball to the forehead, which one would that be? And if you're thinking this or that or the other one, um, you're all correct because all those patients had a brain surgery with very big reconstruction involving large portion of the skulls. And I'm gonna answer those questions in the next couple of sides, who, which patient had what. So neuroplastic surgery is a new field that was started at Johns Hopkins in 2016 and was aimed to bridge the gap between neurosurgery and plastic surgery. We're mostly dealing with complex neurocranial reconstruction, and we essentially want to ensure that patients have complete preservation or restoration of their preoperative appearance. And why is it important or why, why do we even talk about it? Because, you know, back in 47, where it's all started at Johns Hopkins as a chairman, you used to tell your patients, if you survive the brain surgery, you should accept any deformities with resignation. This is necessary evil and it needs to be accepted. And unfortunately, still in 2023, I see patients that are coming from all over telling me that their surgeon tell them that they need to just live life like that. And basically, if you talk to those patients, you know, those patients wake up in the morning, they look at the mirror and they hate themselves. They have post-trauma, they feel better about their looks, you know, they, they think about their ICU stay and the craniotomy. And whenever you're done with your surgery, you want to be done. You don't want to think about it anymore. And, and the reason is that if you look at the numbers, and this is a picture of a, of a, a classic patient that had a stroke or TBI and underwent hemicraniectomy and he went to rehab and now he needs to get reconstructed. If you look at those patients, data, complication rate is very high. Actually, between 35 to 40% complication rate is recorded for those patients in the reconstruction. And if you look at the, you know, if you look at the numbers, you understand that the, the basically there is a reason not to use the patient's own bones anymore because bones get resorbed and get infected. And also there is a reason to reconstruct patients because the CSF hydrodynamics and brain function is better whenever it's covered. So the reconstruction is not only to protect the brain, but also to restore uh, the function of the brain that works much better. This is a meta-analysis from Stanford, 8,000 patients, eight years long, shows that every one of our third, three patients fail. So a third of our patients with craniopause is failing. This is very hard surgery, not because it's technically challenged, because, but because there are a lot of complication rates. 
And therefore, there is a need for a new subspecialty that is training and dedicating to adult neurosurgical reconstruction. And why is that? Neurosurgeons are at the net, right? Rightfully, in the past 100 years, we focus on the brain and all our research efforts focus on the brain itself and the brain tissue. Plastic surgeons sitting in the background, whenever we need them, we call them, but they don't really focus their research efforts on the dura, on the skull, on the soft tissue, on the scalp. And therefore, there is a no man's land, an area in neurosurgery and plastic surgery that nobody deals with. And this is unhabitat area or undesirable, you know, people may say, needs to be more research and more focused. And this is where neuroplastic surgery come into play. So this is a, an, a diagram of uh, the sequence of events for, uh, for two different patients. This patient on the left is a breast cancer patient. She was diagnosed with breast cancer and now she's going to the oncologist and the general surgeon to talk to her about the resection. On the same settings, she will see the plastic and reconstructive surgeon that is gonna talk about the reconstructive surgery called oncoplastic reconstructive surgery, one time OR, resect the tumor, and then reconstruct the breast. And this can be achieved with a multidisciplinary team discussion. When a brain cancer patient gets diagnosed, he does a pre-op workup, you see the neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon, we take them to the OR, we do the operation, and if they have any issues after, like deformity, temporal hollowing, exposed hardware, wound adhesence, where do they go now? Do they go to the dermatologist? Do they go to the plastic surgeon? Do they go to the neurosurgeon? And this is the question mark that we're here to answer. Um, you know, those are some cases that we see as neuroplastic surgery. Patient had a TBI, you'll see on the left upper corner, a major brain bleed had a hemicraniectomy, had a reconstruction, the scalp wound broke down, now there is exposed mesh. You see there is exposed uh, skull here, um, you know, exposed soft tissue. They did a surgery to remove the implant. Now, you know, there is a big setback. This is a patient that was reconstructed with a mesh and the mesh started to show on the skin. This is a very bad, wound that needs to be treated as well as cranioplasty. But then there is a question, how much tissue there is to uh, rearrange? Is it going to be tension free closure? Is the scar strong enough to hold the tissues? And basically, there is a paper that I had to review a few months ago that showed this case of a guy that had a TBI, a brain bleed, hemicraniectomy. And after they removed the mesh, they had another 10 or 20 operations to fix him. And they were done fixing him. This is how he looked like. Picture D. All right. And this is still in 2023. Okay. And I'm here to say we need to do a better job. Um, we wrote the first book chapter in the principles of neurosurgery that was published last year to give residents our algorithm on how to come about all those scalp and skull defects after neurosurgery. And now every neurosurgeon that starts residency gets that book and get to learn about our techniques and about our research and findings fixing those issues. And one of the things that you notice that if you look at the data and you look at patients that needs reconstruction, right? The more reconstructive attempts you have in a center that is not designated to this, the higher risk for complications. Basically, if you can think about it, if you go to get your knee replacement surgery and a general hospital that does general orthopedic surgery, and you don't go to the one specialized doctor in knee replacement, the more attempts you try to replace the knee and it's failed, the higher the risk for complications. That's why there is a need for center of excellence and it's mandatory because we, you know, we know that failed cranioplasty means long 
hospital stay, long, complicated antibiotic course, and very long and expected further surgeries down the road. And we don't want that. Uh, today, 2023, I'm very honored and happy to say that we already established ourselves in a way that we are, you know, bridging the gap between neurosurgery and plastic surgery. And we are essentially merging those two fields to work together to give our patients the most holistic and personalized care to their journey. And I'll give you an example. This is a 67-year-old male. He had a stroke, hemicraniectomy, you know, and he needs another surgery. Now, when you look at the literature, he says, should I need, should I do the other surgery? Just because I know there are a lot of complication rates. I'm, I survived. I can take my kids uh, or my grandkids to school. Why would I want another surgery? And it's our goal to develop the techniques and the algorithms and the team approach in order to give him the best outcomes. And we publish that. And we publish this multidisciplinary ap approach to improve the outcomes. And we look at the total patients and we look at the different techniques that we developed and we found better results. And when you summarize that and you look at single institution, single surgeon cranioplasties, looking at 500 cases, we managed to reduce the complication rate from 36 to 15%. And that's a lot. That's really significant to somebody that wants to make sure that his risk for failure is very small. And this is how it looks after the procedure. That's another case of a patient of mine that he is actually, um, um, uh, was actually found down at a wedding uh, after falling flight of stairs. He was rushed to the, to the hospital, had a subdural hematoma, hemicraniectomy. And he made an amazing and miraculous recovery, completely back to his baseline. And he basically wanted to find out who's going to do his cranioplasty. And not only that, can reassure them that he's not going to have temporal deformity after. And also his complication rate is going to be, you know, uh, limited or minimized. And he's, you know, he's a smart guy. He works at, in finance. And he looked at the data and he found out that when you do a cranioplasty with an uh, alloplastic implant made of any you know, 3D printed material has great results. But the problem with this method is that the, the implant really covers the bone, but not covers the soft tissue, including muscle, fat, and fascia. And he wanted to look like himself again. He didn't want to wear a helmet. He didn't want anybody to ask about his surgery and why did he look like that. And what we did is we basically now can model the skull on the other side and soft tissue as well. And to print implants are not only gonna cover the expected bony defect, but also gonna cover the anticipated soft tissue defect. So when he's done, he looks like that again. And I wanna share a quick video. I'm gonna stop it in the middle, just so you sort of hear his story and see how patients see that type of procedure. My name is Tucker Marr. I am 27. I am from Boston originally, and I've moved to New York in 2021. So my trauma occurred at a very good friend's wedding. I had fallen down a staircase and was found by a friend on the stairwell and come just my girlfriend mary was out on the dance floor i'm sure she was called and rushed to me we immediately knew this wasn't a normal trip and fall and you hit your head they immediately suggested emergency surgery at which point they took off about a third of my skull, about the size of a, a handprint. My life had physically changed once I left the hospital. I had to wear a helmet everywhere. There was almost a right angle in the left side of my head. You can feel the devils of low self-esteem and 
I started getting more and more interested in how am I going to recover from this in a complete way? I started researching a bunch and they got into cranioplasties, you know, the success rates, who was doing it. I found Dr. Ben Shalom, who had joined Lenox Hill and was specialized in this procedure. I think we first met on Zoom. He did an amazing job sharing his process and really made it feel like a team, like he was my teammate and I knew the plan and I knew that the plan would succeed. The first surgery was scary enough to then have him go back under the knife. Everyone obviously was nervous, but we had so much trust in Dr. Ben Shalom and his team and kind of felt like a fairy tale, frankly. So Tucker needed a cranioplastic procedure, which is essentially reconstructing his skull with a 3D printed material. Here at Lenox Hill, we have a multidisciplinary approach, which is essential for successful operation. With computer design, we can match not only the skull, but also the soft tissue to restore the skull and the scalp in its entirety. Tucker came in for a two hour procedure. We completely reconstructed his skull safely and he could immediately see the results. I had not imagined the implant would fit as perfect as it did. I feel like I'm back to the person I was before. Patient self-confidence is a crucial key factor in the long-term outcomes. And feel humbled and grateful for Tucker trusting us. All right, and then, uh, you know, this is uh, this is a uh, you know typical example of a young patient who wants to just feel like himself again. And this uh, was actually featured in the ABC uh, magazine as one of the only centers in New York City that offers that. You can go on and see that uh, article later. Um, I'm going to jump here uh, real quick just so we leave some time for questions. Basically, what I wanted to show you is the opportunity behind you know, using the skull space as a, as a space to add uh, things to that. And uh, this is a patient that uh, had a neuropace device, which is essentially like a pacemaker for the heart, but a pacemaker for the brain to stop epilepsy seizures in drug-resisting epilepsy. The, the, the device works 80% of the time. The problem is that it wasn't really designed to sit on a skull. And we had three patients that got infected. And whenever things are getting infected, you have to open up, you have to wash out, you have to remove the old bone, and uh, then you have to uh, toss the device. But the patient really enjoyed the device because it helped her a lot. So what we did is, um, um, what we did is basically, we printed, 3D printed uh, a skull implant, and then we housed the device within a skull implant that is gonna match exactly the patient's appearance. And now she can be seizure free with a device that is housed in an implant and nobody can tell that she, uh, you know, she actually has this, you know, computer that electrifies her brain and stops uh, seizing. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, liked that and, uh, you know, they came to talk about the other opportunity of housing things within a cranial implant. And we published that uh, in as a first in human in the Journal of Neurosurgery back in 2017. Another option or another opportunity came about when this patient came back after a surgery with this wound on the left side of the scalp. There was actually a breaking of the scalp from a, a VP shunt. What happened is that he had a VP shunt that was pushing on the scalp from below and really causing local tissue ischemia because of the interference of the blood supply. And with time, the scalp gets so thin that it pushes on the valve and until the valve breaks out the skin. And we had to find a way to fix it in a way that it's not going to happen again. And what we did is we used the skull space, his own skull space. We remove a piece of bone. Within the piece of bone, we house an implant that perfectly matches with a mold for the valve. And then we implant that in a way that it's zero profile, as you can see here. And you can appreciate here in the 3D model, you see how the... Um, how uh, there is a zero profile device here above uh, in, within the skull compared to a high valve that is sitting on top of the skull. And we published that in First in Human. Another opportunity came about when this, you know, this type of patients that we see quite a lot, we remove the bone, 
but then the vents are getting bigger, the brain shift, there is a large, swell, you know, big swelling outside the, the skull. And then we can't really push the brain inside to fix it or to restore the form with an implant. And this patient came about after a gunshot injury, which survived amazingly and did amazing recovery and had uh, this brain bulge, right? And her mother said, if you're gonna put the implant back, how do I know it's not gonna push on the skull or on the brain? So we branched with a company that producing uh, wireless intracranial pressure device that tells us the pressure in the brain all the time. And it's wireless. So if you think about it, you take the device, you attach it to the implant, you attach it to the brain, and then every day you can look at the ICP, the intracranial pressure. And you don't have to be connected to like big screens. This is little remote control. You put above the patient's head and you can see the ICP. And we published that as a first in human uh, intracranial pressure device implanted in, inside a skull implant. So to summarize, we're starting to do more and more with the skull implants and embed technologies and really, um, you, you know, and really change the way we thought about reconstruction, not only to restore form, but maybe to give more information, maybe to enhance functions and to make patients feel better again. Uh, some other, uh, you know, this is another thing that uh, we are part of as neuroplastic surgeon is those BCI, brain computer interface cases where we have to or we try to bypass a spinal cord injury. We implant those electrode arrays that are then connected to those pedestals, connected to the skull, and then the, the engineers and fine scene try to bypass spinal cord injury so the patient can move their arms again. And I had the privilege, those surgeries happens once every couple of uh, every couple of years. I have the privilege to uh, be participating in those both at Hopkins and here. And this is the last patient from a few months ago at North Shore, uh, with, together with Dr. Ash Mehta and the Feinstein Institute of uh, Bioelectronic Medicine. We implanted those two pedestals and five electrode arrays to essentially bypass a spinal cord injury. Uh, we publish quite a lot. There are over 300 publications in both Journal of Neurosurgery and uh, Journal of uh, Craniofacial Surgery. And this is my personal interest in, in researching those uh, skull implants and see what else they can do except restoring the form and function. And what I did as a research fellow, I investigated the properties of this clear acrylic material that is named polymethylmethacrylate. And I wanted to know if it's going to be transparent to Wi Fi. Bluetooth, and also ultrasound. And I first did my studies on cadavers, as you see me holding here this uh, window to the brain with, uh, with a cadaver brain. And I was very surprised to see that ultrasound is transmissible. And then we next uh, did it on a real patient. And if you look at the image on the right, you see this is a coronal view of the CT. You see the scar on the left side. You see the implant on the right side. And then you see the ventricular system on a CAT scan, and you can, you know, very easily identify the same anatomy with just a bedside ultrasound. Zoom in magnification, you see the beautiful anatomy of the ventricles with the ultrasound compared to a CT scan. And here we found a pathology. So we did that on a patient and found an epidural hematoma with an ultrasound. And the ultrasound doesn't have to be big and fancy, the one that you would see in the ICU. It can be as small as uh, essentially a wireless uh, iPhone. This is how it looks like. The patient is going into surgery. We are doing the cranioplasty to reconstruct the right side of the face. The implant is clear. We're closing the stitches with a tension-free closure and multiple layers of stitches. And this is the ultrasound of the patient at bedside just two days after surgery. See the beautiful anatomy. And if you really look into that and study the anatomy, you can see quite a lot, which is very exciting for us. And for me in particular, what I'm looking into is investigating that in hydrocephalus patient, as you see here, instead of sending the patients for a repeat CT and repeat MRI, we can do a bedside ultrasound and look at the ventricle system. This was published in the Neurosurgery Journal. It got the cover because basically what we say, instead of putting a titanium mesh uh, burr hole cover, put this little window, and now you can look at the brain with an ultrasound. All right. My personal interest is to look at tumor, tumor recurrence, and tumor surveillance. 
I have a passion uh, for brain tumor surgery, and my goal is to see if ultrasound can uh, detect tumor recurrence earlier. As you can see here, this is a GBM case that I did. Uh, you see this uh, this large mass that is uh, superficial. This is the midline. Those are the ventricles. This is after the this is the removal. You see the cavity, and you see here how I noticed there is some kind of a growth with an ultrasound just one month post-op, and indeed the patient had a recurrence. Uh, these are some examples of the sizes of these implants or those windows. Doesn't have to be big; they can be as small as a uh, a little uh, uh, penny, and uh, we can see quite a lot. I published that on the you know Journal of Neurosurgery, sorry, as the textbook of the Schmidt textbook of uh, neurosurgical techniques. And again, you know, it's the first time that residents has the opportunity to sort of learn about that and expose themselves to this new field. So to summarize the evolution of cell phones, I like to show this picture have been quite amazing in the past twenty five years. Not so much for craniopasties, you know, we're still, you know, learning and, uh, and doing this and basically uh, getting better and better. But I feel and believe that same as cardiologists, you know, caught up the speed from external, you know, pacemakers to very internalized pacemakers. We're doing the same with neurosurgery. And in the long, not too long futures, we'll be able to replace the bone flap with a little window that not only gives you uh, a window to the brain, but also has an internal ultrasound that can take pictures of the brain every day. And then AI sends you uh, like a, you know, like a notification, hey, there is something going on here. Either there is a bleed or edema or the tumor is coming back. Uh, so this can be, you know, a GBM patient, epilepsy patient, hydrocephalus patient, or Parkinson's. And, uh, you know, I say, what else can we do to restore their function? but also enhance you know, the information we get uh, from those patients. Uh, that's it. This is uh, the first uh, uh, part of my presentation. I'm gonna leave uh, the second part for next week and I want to leave some uh, room for uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ben Shalom. Um, we have quite a few questions um, from our brain turns. Um, D, D, D. I'm just trying to pick one. Um, so uh, one question, how do you approach a situation in which a patient's body rejects um, a, like a shunt or an implant? What do you usually do when um, that type of case arises? So basically the body uh, normally rejects uh, if there is an infection, right? And whenever you have an infection in a settings of foreign body that is not really integrated with the tissues and we cannot treat it with antibiotics because there is no blood supply, you have to uh, you do the right thing and to remove the hardware and then do everything uh, from the beginning. Our goal as neuroplastic surgeon is to do everything that we can to prevent this infection when we're using foreign bodies, shunts, uh, technologies, and materials. And that's why there is a fellowship that, you know, takes one year to complete to learn all those different techniques to mitigate infections, scars, pains, and deformities after any type of neurosurgery. Um, this is a great question, actually. And I, we, we were just talking about this, but um, how accessible um, is it for patients to receive a neuroplastic and reconstructive procedure? Like, are there socioeconomic barriers or um, barriers in terms of navigating insurance coverage? Um, how, you know, how, how often are these procedures covered by insurance? So as Hannah said, this is not a cosmetic surgery. We are not enhancing appearance. We are reconstructing it. And I never got any denial from insurance companies for any of my procedures. Uh, the, 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 you know, the one challenge is there are not a lot of neuroplastic programs in the country. There are only you know, four of them, that's it. And if you really want to get this comprehensive approach, you need to find that one program that uh, fits your desires and needs and, uh, and find the right surgeons. Our goal and, you know, our, Goal of everybody in this field, in the medical field, including you guys and brain turns, is to educate both patients and providers and surgeons that there is a new field that is emerging and novel to treat those kind of problems. Unfortunately, 
as much as we try to give out talks and publish and show the world what we can do, there are still surgeons that don't even know about this field. And our goal is to uh, educate and teach and be prolific. And uh, thanks to you, people like you in, you know, in brain turn that are interested in the neurosciences, we can reach more people and let them know about us. Um, another great question. Um, uh, so is, do um, pediatric neurosurgeons implement neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery uh, techniques when operating on uh, adolescent patients? And is it, um, how feasible is it given, the, given that the skull and the brain continue to grow? So basically, that's this is this is a great question because um, because in pediatrics uh, there is a field that's called craniofacial surgery. All right, craniofacial surgery is actually a subspecialty that is dedicated to the pediatric craniofacial deformities. The problem is that the diseases for the pediatric population is different than the diseases for the adult population. And whatever, whatever you encounter as a craniofacial surgery in PEDS is completely different ball game when it comes to the adult life. And the diseases are different, um, the pathologies are different, um, the mechanism is different, and also uh, treatments are different. Um, when it comes to reconstructing a pediatric head or skull with an alloplastic implant, the recommended time in the literature is after the skull have matured its growth. And usually it's being done by the age of seven years old. So if somebody would reach out to me for a craniopathy of a child, I would say, wait until they're seven years old for alloplastic reconstruction. Um, what do you do if a patient um, had a brain tumor resection and you implant a 3D printed cranial implant and then the tumor um, actually comes back and there's a, a tumor recurrence? What do you do when that situation arises? So this is, this, is, uh, this is a great question. And the answer is straightforward. The, the, the implant is being attached in the periphery with screws and plates. So if you print the implant in the right in, in the, to begin with, in the right shape and size, and uh, and, um, and and you think about that for the probability or possibility for a need for another operation, you plan everything in advance. So when the patients come in for the currents, all you have to do is open the scalp like an open book, remove the hood, which is the implant, take out the tumor, and put back the hood in place. But you need preparation. You need to foresee that and anticipate that in a first surgery. And this is what we do as neuroplastic surgeons. We anticipate and we think about the recurrence in the first surgery. Um, and kind of on the same note, what, how, what do you do to prepare for these types of procedures that can be very complex and, um, and, and you know, um, yeah, that you, yeah, you, you have to prepare for the worst and that you might have to um, operate again. What do you do to prepare for that? I'm going to tell you next Wednesday at 11 a.m. when I, I play my next, next session, how we prepare and the technologies are available. All right, you guys. So if you want the answer, you have to tune back in <laughs> next Wednesday. <laughs> um, and then uh, how long does a, a typical neuroplastic and reconstructive uh, procedure take? Um, I know it kind of depends on the case and what, um, what the patient's diagnosis is. Yeah, exactly. I would say somewhere between, uh, you know, the average, the average would be somewhere between two to six hours, depends on the complexity, depends on the pathology, but it varies, you know, I would say that it's, you can't really answer these questions, but most of my cases are not, uh, do not go beyond six hours. Um, are there any complications that patients tend to have other than a uh, risk of infection after undergoing a neuroplastic and reconstructive C uh, procedure? Basically same as like any other surgery, right? Infections, bleeding, seizures, uh, hematomas, uh, you know, pulmonary uh, embolos, DVTs, all the other things that are the same across surgery disciplines. Um, so in addition to neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery, you are also um, uh, very involved in neuro-oncology and um, have, have 
um, we begun to implement um, brain tumor treatments into um, cranial implants. Like we've been incorporating uh, devices like shunts and pacemakers into the implants. Yeah, I think that uh, this is a great question and exciting news is there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of clinical trials and research going on in implantable devices for brain tumor patients, including medicine delivery chambers, including focused ultrasound uh, uh, devices that try to bypass a blood brain barrier with implantable devices. Uh, this is where I think my, you know, my skill set um, being realized most when I can combine my both you know, oncology fellowship and neuroplastic fellowship to really understand all aspects of the disease and uh, give the uh, complete package, I would say. Um, this is what I'm passionate about. I can't wait to, uh, you know, to explore those up and coming technologies. And we're, we're, we're having a very active research um, on that, actually. Do you anticipate there being um, a neuroplastic and reconstructive surgery uh, or a focused residency in the future? Do you think this will become um, more than a fellowship program? I hope so. One day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's it's so it's so it's such a young it's such a young subspecialty. It's such a young and um, and new. Uh, the future is exciting, but yet to be determined. And this is what's fun about it. You can go to multiple different directions. Um, ooh, we have a really good question. Um, do you also work alongside neuro-oncologists, neurovascular surgeons, and other surgeons when you plan or perform a surgery? Or is it a completely separate process and, and, you, and there's no crossover between those um, specialists? Absolutely. That's a great question. Basically, the uniqueness of Lennox Seal, I think, is the crosstalk and cross collaboration. We work together all the time. I did a case with Dr. Bukvar yesterday, and I did a case with Dr. Langer last week. We work together all the time because we know that two sets of eyes and two sets of hands with different skills are better for the patient. So absolutely, yes. We work together. This is not a one-man show. I don't like to operate by myself. I think it's, I think it's A, not as fun. B, the patients get better outcomes when two surgeons are focusing their entire, you know, efforts on them. So yes, we collaborate with a vascular neurosurgeon, with the oncologist, with a skull base, and uh, the neuro, you know, with everybody that sees and understands the benefit of working together. And I think that Lenox Hill is a very unique place because we are, we are, trying as much as, 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 we, as we can to work together on each and every patient to give them the absolute best outcomes. Oh, we have so many questions. We only have a few minutes left. Um, um, here's one, but uh, how do you re like reconstruct the skull and the scalp after opening it? Um, it's, you know, it's a pretty invasive procedure to undergo and and um, what do you do? Like, let's say if the scalp is no longer viable and you can't use that skin uh, because it's been maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, compromised due to radiation or hardware poking through the, the scalp. Another amazing question. If you want to know the answer, you have to wait for next Wednesday. <laughs> 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 because all of it is going to be covered in my next talk. So um. I'm really happy I managed to uh, uh, plant some interest and you know for and plant the seeds for next talk. So yeah, I'll talk about all of this next 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 Wednesday. Um, all right, let's do one more question. Um, what sort of materials do you use when um with with um in terms of cranial implants? Do you do you like to use titanium implants, acrylic? With what kind of materials do you like to use? Do you like to use the original bone flap? What um what 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 is yeah your pre preferred material of choice? Ah, <laughs> uh, this is a, a great question, and I think that uh, I get this question all the time. And um, the way the way they answer it is it depends, right? Um, there is no one size fits all. 
Uh, it very much depends on the patients, their age, their condition, their comorbidities, their smoking history, their radiation history, their infection history. And if anyone tells you, oh, I use PEAK or I use PMA or I use MESH, they're mostly not really understand or care as much about the different implants. There's a lot of studies and we study the different properties of the different implants and, 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 and which one is better and more resilience. And I have to say that it very much depends on the patient. You know, it's not, it, you know, every type of material benefits different type of patients. So when I see patients, I sit with them, I get all their information, I understand, you know, previous history. I also talk about their hobbies and their interests and their goals to understand what is the best solution or materials for them. That's why there is no one, you know, good implant. They're all good for different reasons. Fantastic. Well, it is 12 o'clock on the dot. Thank you again, Dr. Ben Shalom. It was a pleasure having you again. Um, you. And as Dr. Ben Shalom stated, he will be giving um, the second part of this presentation next Wednesday. Um, so be sure to tune in to Brain Turns next Wednesday. And uh, Dr. Ben Shalom, is it okay if I share your email with uh, the- Please the do. Cohort? Please share my email, share my social media. I think this is a great place to follow me, what I do. Thanks to uh, thanks to Hannah, I try to uh, upload and publish some cool cases uh, for you to watch and see. And if you want to uh, follow me and give us a like, Hannah all has all the information on how to do that. Yes, thank you so much, Nadi. You're the best, and oh, um, and I look forward to part two of your talk next week. Thank you so much again for joining us. Likewise. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to share my screen one more time with our uh, social media. Perfect. Um, share my social media too. Bye. Yes. Yes. Um, follow Naughty at uh, uh, B underscore Naughty um, on Instagram. He is actually going to be posting some cool videos um, this week. So you don't want to miss that content. Bye, um, guys. Thank you. Here are our social links. I'll put the LinkedIn uh, Slack and Facebook links in the chat before we log out. But again, this is how you can stay in touch with us. Take a screenshot. Please follow us. We love social media and it's just a great way for us to continue to stay in touch with you. Um, when, you know, once the webinar series concludes, but also a great way for us to share with you guys about more free educational opportunities that are going on. Uh, D D D. All right. So. I'm going to uh, stop my share and then Oh, oops, I posted Dr. Wiley's email twice instead of Dr. Cerule's. Thank you for catching that. Um I'm going to make sure I share the email, the right email. D -d 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 -d. Uh okay. Copy. Ah. Come on, there we go. All right, so here are the emails for today's speakers. And then I'm going to post the link to the Facebook and the Slack channel so you can join those groups. Um, Dr. Wiley said she was going to share her presentation with us, so we will post that on the Slack channel as soon as possible on Facebook. All right, one more link, and then I'll let you guys get out of here. Um, here we go. Here's the link to join our Facebook group. All right, and with that, 
you are free to enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thank you all so much for joining us again. I'll see you online tomorrow. Um, just uh, so you know, uh, tomorrow we will be talking about innovations in neuro-oncology with Dr. John Bookvar. We'll have a pediatric neurosurgery virtual OR with Dr. Sean Rogers. And we're gonna hear from um, one of our former students who is now in residency, uh, Dr. Devin O'Donnell. So we're really excited to have have her on uh, our webinar tomorrow and we'll see you then. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. Bye. <laughs>